The fair in 1964 provided a timely glimpse of the planet's current realities and future expectations. The New York Times described it as a glittering mirror of our national opulence. It seemed to portend a future where the biggest worry for average Americans would be how to spend their leisure time. I just took it for granted that I, you know, I'd always have a roof over my head and enough to eat. The thought that I'd have to worry about where my next meal was coming from, these thoughts just didn't occur to me. But of course part of the reason we could think that way is that we took prosperity more or less for granted. In his speech at the World's Fair, President Lyndon Johnson touted a world of prosperity. But that people, people, they shall have the best. All of these breeds. Only to find himself interrupted in mid-speech by demonstrators who felt themselves frozen out of the world. Despite a lengthy struggle, the millions of black Americans still did not share in the nation's prosperity or enjoy the full rights of their citizenship. In 1964, many expected that such inequities would soon be addressed. We thought that essentially the material problems of the world had been solved and that the important thing now is to solve the moral problems. There was a society that had to be changed and it was not going to be changed unless some people decided that they would dedicate their lives to changing it. It was not going to change spontaneously. The World's Fair that year was held in Flushing Meadows, New York. It was supposed to promote the culture and customs of people everywhere in keeping with its theme of peace through understanding. But it would not be long before Americans would be driven apart by societal disagreements within their own borders and a terrible, costly war on the other side of the globe. The country was not about to experience much of either peace or understanding. In the mid-1960s, the determination to challenge traditional boundaries seemed to be growing in almost every arena. Perhaps most striking was a broadening struggle for civil rights, a struggle that many whites now joined in large numbers. In the summer of 1964, hundreds of college students, white and black, headed south to Mississippi, where many blacks were still mired in a Jim Crow world of poverty and political impotence. These students from the North hoped to register black voters and establish so-called freedom schools to teach literacy skills to those who'd been denied them. They were traveling into a world where many people were set in their ways. President Lyndon Johnson warned the students that the federal government could not guarantee their safety. They received a lot of training to, in order to prepare them for life in Mississippi, which was not going to be very easy. It wasn't easy for us, and we tried to make that very clear to people. I mean, our lives are on, you know, are in imminent danger every, every minute of the day. When we crossed the line into Mississippi, and it said, Mississippi welcomes you, it was the first time I felt really afraid. In the first group to arrive in Mississippi were students Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, and James Cheney. Within days, all three of them were missing. Bob Moses, who was the head of the Mississippi Summer Project, brought the group together, told us that they were missing, and it was clear to all of us that it was extremely likely that they were dead. Just, just put your feet up in there and walk up on in there. 
Six weeks after their disappearance, the three were discovered buried in an earthen dam, shot in the head. In that summer of 1964, the Ku Klux Klan was still trying to stop the forces of change. But among the students and in the homes and churches of the black community, the feeling grew stronger that change could not be prevented. We went up to the home of a very poor black woman, sharecropper shack. She had a bunch of kids. She came to the door, she looked at her feet, she said, yes, I'm no to everything we said. And we tried to persuade her to sign this. And it was very clear, she signed it, she might get thrown out of her home. After a few minutes of talking, she suddenly straightened up, looked us in the eyes, and said, I'll sign it. And she signed it. That's how powerful the movement was. And the movement expanded to other causes at the end of the so-called Freedom Summer. The First Amendment didn't apply to any campuses in the country. You, you couldn't give a speech without getting it cleared by the administration. When Freedom Summer veterans at the University of California at Berkeley tried to recruit others to their cause, they were barred by university regents. It just set off this explosion among the students and people who had never had a political thought in their, their head just got fired by the idea that someone couldn't tell them when and where to say what they wanted to say. You don't stand up for your freedom now. You're dead, guys. United by what they saw as an injustice, thousands of students began a series of protests that lasted eight weeks. When college officials threatened to expel several of the student leaders, the conflict reached a boiling point. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. You have to put your body on the wheels, and um, we're going to go in there, and we're going to uh, take over this building. And so when the crowd began to move, I just went with it. Some people looked a little scared because they'd never done anything like that before. I was scared. When the student takeover of the campus building resulted in more than 800 arrests, the university faculty finally weighed in on the side of the demonstrators. Cornered as they were, the regents granted free speech to the students. And thus began an era of confrontation at American universities. In late 1964, another fight was looming for Americans, this one thousands of miles from home, and with far more devastating consequences. For several years, American advisors had been sent to South Vietnam to help prevent what the administration said was a takeover by the Communist North. Things were not going well in the South. President Lyndon Johnson decided to dramatically increase the U.S. military commitment to Vietnam. And just as they had throughout history, young Americans answered the call to arms. I didn't want to see my son go, and he promised nothing was going to happen to him, you know, and uh, that it was going to be over very shortly, and he'd be home before I, before I knew it. You grew up watching those John Wayne movies where the good guys always win. I was being John Wayne, and I was going to go, and I was going to beat them, and nothing could hurt me. Like many other young men in 1965, Jack Bronson knew very little about war, except that America didn't lose them. This one looked at first to be no exception. The United States, which had defeated Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan and held back the Communist Chinese in Korea, now faced a third world army of North Vietnamese soldiers and South Vietnamese Viet Cong guerrillas. American commanders confidently predicted a swift and positive conclusion. I was excited about going to war. The whole battalion was excited about going to war. We were, uh, we were uh, gung-ho.
With 125,000 fresh troops and an armada of helicopters ranging all over South Vietnam, American generals were spoiling for a good fight. They were about to get one. On November the 15th, 1965, Lieutenant Larry Gwynn's unit was helicoptered to a valley in central Vietnam near the Cambodian border. They had gone to intersect the North Vietnamese supply routes to the south. North Vietnamese soldiers watched them arrive. It was my first real hot landing zone. And it was so hot that I had exited my ship, knelt in the grass for about 10 seconds, and a guy pops up next to me whom I knew had just been shot through the shoulder and said, I'm hit, Lieutenant. A major battle with the enemy was just what the military brass had been hoping for. Only, it was not going according to plan. At 10 in the morning, Lieutenant Gwynn was fighting for his life. Our first platoon was overrun. Our second platoon was pinned down by mortar fire. I saw about 40 North Vietnamese soldiers coming across the landing zone at us. And all I did was say, here they come, and start shooting at them. 1 p.m. The American commander sent out an emergency signal. Broken arrow. U.S. troops in danger of being overrun. Every available aircraft was called in against the North Vietnamese positions. including the giant B-52 bombers. The B-52 is uh, terrible, terrible in many ways, because firstly, there was no way you can fight back it. You can't run. There's no time for you to run. So you just lay there, waited for the death to come and, and grip you. Thousands of men died in those desperate hours. By the time the battle was over, 3,500 North Vietnamese and 305 Americans had been killed. It was obvious to the men in the field what lay ahead. Preoccupied as he was with the growing war in Vietnam, President Johnson knew that he had to address problems at home. Despite America's prosperity, 40 million citizens still live below the poverty line. And this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. In May 1964, the president unveiled the grand plan for what he called the Great Society. Mr. Johnson hoped to match the power and vitality of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal with a list of welfare, job, and educational opportunities to aid underprivileged Americans. But the privilege that many Southern blacks most desired was the right to vote, still often denied them. In Selma, Alabama, 97% of 15,000 eligible black voters were unregistered. Some because of cynicism or apathy, but most because they faced violence and intimidation from local authorities. People could only attempt to register on the first and third Mondays of each month. The Board of Registrars is not in session this afternoon as you went for him. You came down to make a mockery out of and you had to get some white person to vouch that you were a good character. No white person in his right mind in the state of Alabama were going to vouch that a black person was a good character. If we're wrong, why don't you arrest us? We've come to register to Selma rapidly became the new flashpoint of the civil rights movement. On March the 7th, 1965, 600 civil rights activists planned a march that was to take them from Selma to the state capitol in Montgomery, some 54.